working together to produce an ever greater abundance of material and spiritual values for all. That is the secret of American prosperity. Relative power really matters in international politics. What people mean by that is, you know, uh, who's got the biggest army, uh, what share of international trade do you have, who's got the baddest navy. The United States has huge amounts of assets. The most powerful guns, biggest military in the world, the most advanced military, great structural power economically, it owns the dollar. You know, arguably the world's leading universities, vast allies, uh, English language, all sorts of things like that. It's still the place where you know, more Nobel Prizes are won than anywhere else in the world. And this does matter in international politics, but if you focus just on relative power, you can miss something really important. And that is what I like to call usable power. Your ability to actually translate your raw capability those assets that you have, those resources, into actual influence internationally. America is many things to many people. The way in which we think about the United States as world power needs to change. The United States no longer has the same capacity to run the world that it used to. The age of U.S. unipolarity was one that the entire world welcomed. And part of that was that the United States, even though it was the world's largest economy, it had the best, best guns, the, the top military, it was the most powerful nation, was unrivaled technologically, militarily. It did not sit on just that. The paradox was that it became ever more powerful by giving away that power. It constructed an inclusive global order that was transparent, that was democratic, and to which it invited everyone who subscribe to those ideals. So paradoxically, by making the world less dominated by just itself, it became ever more powerful. One of the questions that I've been examining over the last uh, 10 years at least, certainly since the turn of the century, is, is the whole question of America's position in the international order. The pessimists will tell you, and there are a lot of pessimists in the United States as, as well as on, uh, on, in other parts of the world, the pessimists will tell you basically that, that America's broke. It's broke socially, it's broke politically, it's divided against itself, uh, the politics don't work, the Constitution prevents people taking decisions. The real problem in the U.S. right now with respect to, domestically, with respect to U.S. foreign policy is partisanship. Republicans hate Democrats, Democrats hate Republicans. The U.S. is deeply polarized along partisan lines. Today, partisanship is about as bad as it was in the late 19th century. But there's a really important difference. In the late 19th century, the United States was a relatively unimportant international power. So whatever kind of commitments it had or made internationally, and there weren't many, uh, it didn't really matter. The United States has commitments all over the world today. So it does matter. After the Cold War, it seemed as if America was on top of the world dominant power, the unipolar moment was there. After the 10 years since then, people have been talking quite the opposite. America's on the way down since the war on terror, since the 2008 crash, and since the rise of China. How do the rising powers challenge the United States? What kind of world order would we move to? One way to think about that is, will some other country, China say, displace the United States as the world's lead power? What I've been trying to do in my work, and the work we've been doing here at the London School of Economics, is to try and work out the, what, what, what all this really means over the very long term. And the conclusion I've come to is very simple, that America does remain the number one power in the world. Uh, China will not challenge it for a very, very long time economically. The dollar will remain supreme. China will live and grow up and continues to rise within an American-led order. Nonetheless, changes in the world are making that order created by the United States at the end of World War II, much more difficult to manage. So I think it's fundamentally not one of American decline, but America living in an increasingly complex world. My own view is that the United States is not really suffering from a loss of relative power internationally. What concerns me right now is the loss of usable power. That is, that what is happening inside the United States politically is having an effect on the United States, on the country's ability to translate that raw power 
into influence. Now, of course, there's lots of problems domestic to the United States, but my view has always been that America's got a very strong political system. It's a very resilient political system. It can take a lot of battering. It also has a lot of resilience culturally. And by the way, millions of people still want to go and live and work there, which also gives it an enormous asset. People want to become Americans. Heck, the, the other candidate for world leadership at this point, China, the Chinese want to be American. The Chinese people want to be American people. China, on the other hand, has a lot of assets. It's economically rising, it's a big manufacturing base. It's achieved enormous amounts of things, including poverty reduction. It's created more middle class people over the last 15 years than any other part of the world. It's also kept us out of a world recession. The fact remains, China has four times the population of the United States. Simple arithmetic tells us that the instant China overtakes the United States, its average citizen will have an income exactly one fourth that of the average American citizen. It, that's just, you know, that's just arithmetic. China doesn't, it seems to me, have a vision of what it means to be a world power. However, we can ask seriously about the tendency, the direction of movement here. Are people watching more Chinese movies? Are they interested in Korean pop? Is there an emergence of an East Asian sensibility surrounding music and culture? And I would say yes, absolutely.